Hello and welcome to Jonathan's Arrow, where we aim to shoot for the truth of the whole Word of God. In today's study, we are going to be looking into Proverbs chapter 15 and seeing God's wisdom unfold for us there. But before we do, let us go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for this study today. Dear Lord, my God and my Redeemer, I want to thank you and praise you for your gloriousness and your grace in my life, that you have allowed me to be a minister of your word, that I may give the word of God in its truth and its entirety, as it is sorely lacking and needed this day. I do want to pray, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to lead and guide in this study and all future studies, so that I would be a blessing unto all those who would hear this marvelous word. As I pray these things in your precious, holy, and righteous name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, let us go ahead and read Proverbs chapter 15. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord, how much more than the hearts of the children of men. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs, where love is, than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. The way of the slothful man is as an hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it! The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the peer are pleasant words. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Let us begin by taking a look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 1. It says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. This verse is talking about how we ought to choose our words wisely. 
The Bible says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Well, what is a soft answer? It is speaking kindly and gently. It isn't really giving up the truth, but we are to have compassion. Now, oftentimes, what, when we tell folks the truth of the word of God, it doesn't seem very compassionate. If I tell somebody that except they repent, they shall likewise perish. As Jesus told us, the very most compassionate man who had ever existed, some folks don't look at that as compassion. They think, well, that's just hellfire and brimstone. Actually, folks, hellfire and brimstone is the most vehement way you can be compassionate to somebody. If a person is told by you, if a man is told by you that he can just do whatever he pleases and God loves him regardless, and he finds himself winding up in hell, how much compassion do you think he will honestly consider that you have had on him while he's burning in all eternity because of your lies, because he believed your lies? God wants us to tell folks the truth so that they can get the truth and make a decision based on the truth. Jesus tells us that except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That perish is hell, fire, and brimstone forever and ever and ever. A soft answer doesn't necessarily mean I'm tickling your ears. It just means that I'm not screaming at you, shouting at you, and calling you belial and a waste of flesh. I am instead giving you the righteous truth of the word of God and the righteous truth that he has for you, but I'm not doing it aggravated or with hatred in my heart or with any kind of malice. Instead, I'm just trying to help you out. I'm trying to give you the right words. But grievous words stir up anger. What is a grievous word? A grievous word is when I would tell somebody that they're foolish just because I don't like them, or they're ugly just because I don't like the way they look, or I don't like you, you're, you're no good, or stuff like that. Grievous words are words that do not have a real righteous point to them. They're, they're usually sharp, and all they're for is to hurt someone. That's a grievous word. In verse number two, we see, The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Now, this is a verse of discernment, and we are going to see tons of verses of discernment throughout this chapter, and I'm going to try my best to show forth exactly what God is talking about in these verses of discernment and how we can use them. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Now, remember, in almost every instance in the Bible, and in fact, I would say more so than not, when God talks about knowledge, unless he talks about the wicked knowledge or he's specifically mentioning something and not just talking about knowledge in general, knowledge in general is just knowledge of the Bible, knowledge of God's wisdom, knowledge of God. So the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, and that aright just means always right. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And so what we see here is that wise folk will use God's knowledge correctly. There are a lot of people out there who know something of the Bible who do not know how to use that something they know of the Bible. There have been many people who will read small things and say, well, this is a contradiction. God can't possibly be this way, so on and so forth and whatnot, because they do not read the context, and they do not read exactly what God is talking about. Oftentimes, that is the case. Take, for instance, in the book of Psalms, where God tells us in David's account, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. And folks don't understand really what that means because, well, for one, we don't really know what hatred means today. We think hatred is any time you say something no good to somebody or that you put down a, a race or a gender or, or something or, of that nature. Hatred is just the antithesis of love. Everything you do not love, you hate. That is the reality of what that word means. I do not love my foot having a hammer dropped on it. I vehemently hate that. I do not love wars and, and fightings. I vehemently hate those. But I do not have this, like, aggravated dwelling sorrow or anger towards these things because it just doesn't matter. How many times have I ever had a hammer drop on my foot? It just doesn't matter. The antithesis of love is hate. We don't love everything. We do have hate. Human beings have hate. 
The reason why is because we were created in God's image and now in his similitude. Adam was first formed in God's perfect image. That means that we oftentimes share many of the same qualities that God has. Now, we don't have all of his qualities, and he doesn't have all of ours. Sin has entered into this world, and sin is in our hearts. However, what we find very often is that folks do many things that God does. We have anger, God has anger. The difference is is that God only has anger for righteous reasons. Oftentimes we have wrath and anger for stupid reasons. We have jealousy, God has jealousy. Jealousy isn't necessarily a a sin or a wickedness in any way, shape, or form unless it's unjustified. Because what jealousy is, is the desire to have something back that has been taken from you. Like, for instance, if somebody steals my wife away from me, I would have a jealousy wanting my wife back because they've taken her from me. It's just the same with how God is a jealous God against us when we start worshiping other things because those things are taking us away from God and he wants us rightly back. He did not create us so that we can go worship the sun, moon, and stars, friend. He created us so that we'd worship him and fellowship with him. In verse number three, we see the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. The Lord sees all. That's all this is talking about. God sees everything, He beholding the evil and the good. And notice how it says beholding the evil and the good. Evil is not necessarily sin. See, evil is the antithesis of good. Everything that is good in life, there is an antithesis to it. That's not necessarily sin. God doesn't waste his days away looking and beholding sin. But he does see the evil. He sees the evil doers. He sees evil folk. He sees all. Verse number four. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. So a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. And what does that mean? It means that when you're a wholesome tongue, you you speak with whole truth. You speak with whole and entire righteousness. You're going to provide folks a tree of life. They're going to see your wisdom, and they're going to hear your wisdom, and they're going to enact it, and it's going to help them. And that's what this is talking about here in this first part. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. So perverseness in the tongue is a breach in the spirit. A breach is just a hole or a gap. And, uh, you know, for instance, like if you have a breach in a wall, it's a giant hole or a gap where the enemy could approach and come into your walled city or walled castle or some something of that nature. Well, when you have a breach in the spirit, you have perverseness in your tongue, you create holes and gaps in your spirit in which the devil and his demons can come in and influence you. Many Christians today have very many breaches in the spirit. And sometimes it is due to a complete lack of understanding of the word of God. Ignorance. Ignorance oftentimes causes those breaches in the spirit. Verse number five says, A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. This is another verse of discernment. So a fool despiseth his father's instruction. You can tell a fool immediately if he is a man who despiseth his father's instruction. If you hear a father tell his son to do something or his daughter to do something and they refuse it or they hate it or they go, I can't believe I'm doing this again, they're a fool. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Fool. Done. Discussion over. God tells us exactly how to discern folks, and this is how. We can see exactly whether somebody is foolish or wise based on the word of God. But he that regardeth reproof is prudent. So a man who regards his father's reproof, he says, you know what, I'm going to keep that in my heart. I'm going to look unto that. They're prudent. That man is prudent. And the reason why is because your father isn't instructing you because he thinks it's funny. He's instructing you because he wants you to do right. He wants you to seek after righteousness in your life and to have success, just like God the Father. Verse number six. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. 
This is a verse about reaping what you sow. And the house of the righteous is much treasure. Being righteous, God will fill your house with treasure. Does that mean necessarily you're going to have giant chests full of gold all throughout your house and you're going to be wealthy and rich and well-to-do? Not necessarily. Treasure can be many different things, like, for instance, a full belly and a full cupboard or full cabinets or enough clothes for all your household or warmth. There's many different kinds of treasures. There's treasures of spirituality as well. For instance, having righteous children. That's a greater treasure to me than any wealth or riches could ever afford me, is if I had a righteous wife and right, righteous children. Praise the Lord. There are many folks who sigh and, and really sigh in their spirit and, and groan in their spirit because their children are nothing but abominable waste to them. And it's such a shame that so many folks out there are having to deal with that, even if they have raised their children well, because this generation is convincing children to do after wickedness, and they're going hard after the children. With every form of technology there is out there convincing children to disobey God, to disobey their parents, and to do whatever they please. Verse number 7. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. This is a very important verse because it is basically telling us that witnessing is necessary um, and that it's, it's almost a verse of discernment about witnessing. And this is something you can see. I know Christians who have told me before that they will not tell the word of God or tell anything about Christ to anyone unless they are asked first. Let me tell you something, friend. Uh, nobody's going to ask you who Jesus is. Nobody cares in this day. The, the people, the, the average American, the average individual in America has no desire to be told anything about Christianity or told anything about the Bible because it condemns their wicked way. It condemns what they desire to do and who they desire to be. And thereby, with that understanding, you're never going to witness to anyone or at least very few or seldom uh, opportunities will ever approach you if your witness is only given when somebody asks you for it. God tells us that the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. It doesn't say the lips of the wise wait to be asked about knowledge. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, and that knowledge is of the word of God. But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. You can discern whether a Christian is a right spirit concerning their witness just by this verse. Verses 8 and 9 together. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Verses 8 and 9 are telling us that the wicked, not their wickedness, the wicked themselves our abomination to God. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So this is talking about the religiousness of folks. The sacrifice of the wicked. The sacrifice is anything that the wicked is willing to give up for God. Like, for instance, I'm... Many wicked folk are willing to give up their time for God by going to church and believing that they're sated by their attendance. That is why that if I ever had a home church, I would never allow anyone to think that your tithe and your attendance is your righteousness. Tithes wouldn't be even accepted, and attendance is not what makes you godly. Should you go? Absolutely. Should you feel like you have to go of necessity and begrudgingly? No. The Bible says God loveth a cheerful giver. Your time is your time. And if you are willing to sacrifice it because you love the Lord, not just because you believe religion is going to sate your conscience, there is a big difference there. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. God loves the prayer of the upright. He delights in it. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. So everything that the wicked do, the way of the wicked, 
is an abomination to the Lord. We're going to see something very interesting concerning the re- concerning this very thought later on in the chapter twice. It's going to be even more so. And much of what we're reading here, that the sacrifice of the, the wicked is abomination, and that the way the wicked is abomination, folks don't teach that. Folks don't want to offend people. They don't want to tell you, well, that's no good. What you do is no good, regardless of what you do. A man who goes and dies for his country, who is not saved, is not suddenly accepted by God and thereby saved. That is very controversial and a very misunderstood fact. Folks who die in war to protect their country don't get a free pass to heaven. No one gets a free pass to heaven. Ye must be born again. Verse number 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Verse number 10 is that fools hate correction. Fools hate correction. It's just so simple. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. You forsake the way of God. You're not going to want to hear correction from God. You're not going to want to hear correction from God's men telling you, look, you can't do that. You're forsaking the way. You don't want anything to do with that way. Correction is going to be grievous to you. And he that hateth reproof shall die. See, now this is the end of that. This is the end of you forsaking the way and and correction becoming grievous to you. You're going to end up hating reproof. You're going to hate everything God has to say for you. And the Bible tells you, ye shall die. Verse number 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? This verse is kind of hard to be understood at first. Basically, what it's saying is that God has power over hell and destruction and that we are to fear him. But the way it's worded, and because it's older English and formal English, our perfect English, it is hard for folks today to really understand what's being said here. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. The word before means the opposite of the word behind. It's that simple. Behind you means everything in back of you. Before you means everything in front of you. God has power over hell and destruction. It is before him. It's in front of him. He is capable of using it. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Hell and destruction is before the hearts of the children of men because they are going to walk into it without the Lord Jesus Christ. Very simple understanding, but it's very hard to be understood if you don't really see what's going on here. Before has no implication on timing. It has an implication on whether it's in front of you or behind you. Before is in front. It is the perfect and formal of saying in front. Verse number 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. This is a type of discernment, but instead of giving us a good and a bad, or a wise and a foolish way to look at this, it's just telling us the foolish way. And it's saying that a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. Now, we've been over this a thousand times, but it's worth repeating because God repeats it. Obviously, it's worth us seeing it more than once because it bears repeating. Neither will he go unto the wise. A scorner will never go unto the wise because scorners scorn the wise. Why would he go unto the wise? He's admitting defeat and he's humbling himself. Scorners are very prideful folk. They would not be scorning you to your face, mocking you to your face, if they were not prideful. Verses number 13 through 15 go hand in hand, and we'll read that here. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Do we see a common theme here? Verses 13 through 15 is talking about the heart, and the heart being the seat of our being. Everything we do, think, believe, and feel comes to our heart and comes from our heart. It all intertwines there. 
And uh, some folks get really, you know, scientific about this. Like, well, your heart is a beating organ that flows blood throughout your body. Uh, that's very cute. But the heart just means the center of our being. Now, is it also where the heart lies? That's an interesting thought. We're not going to go into that study per se itself. But let's go ahead and look at verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. So a merry heart, a heart that is happy, joyous, that has all these kinds of good feelings, maketh a cheerful countenance. Your countenance is your appearance, how you feel and how you show yourself to be exteriorly. But... By the sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. The spirit oftentimes is either on good terms or bad terms just by how merry or sorrowful your heart is. And many folks know this. Many folks who have uh, been sunk in depression for years know that they don't really have much of a spiritual drive to do much of anything. Verse 14 says, The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. But the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. So the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. So again, this is talking about our hearts. And those of us who have hearts of understanding will seek knowledge. We're going to seek that knowledge of God. We're going to say, you know what, I need to learn whom God is. And then all the days of the afflicted are evil. But he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. And that feast is a feast on goodness. It's a it's a feast on on a a good life. It's basically this is just talking about that rose bedded life that folks want to have or think they'll have because they are Christian. Now the Bible doesn't say a Christian heart hath a continual feast. Unfortunately, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that all those in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We shall suffer. We are going to suffer harm, whether it be through our family or friends or our neighbors or communities or the laws or the land in general. And there be many times where that's the case. Though America is not suffering unto blood when it comes to our Christianity. We are not persecuted unto blood uh, like many other countries are. There are still oftentimes folks who are living and dwelling with family members or friends or whatnot who absolutely and utterly hate them and want to see their downfall because they are Christian and those family members are not. Verses number 16 and 17 go together as well. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Better to be poor with God than rich without God. That's what both these verses are talking about here. Better to have that fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. You know, better is little. God's saying better is little. You're ha you have next to nothing. Better is that poorness with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. So it's better to have nothing but, you know, a dinner of herbs than to have this gigantic feast. Better is to have that, that love with those herbs, that love in your family with, with little, than to have a great feast with a family full of strife and hatred. Verse number 18 says, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Now this is another verse of discernment, but it's a different kind of discernment because it's telling us exactly what folks are going to do about this very situation. A wrathful man stirreth up strife. So a wrathful man is going to stir up fightings. He's going to want people to fight. He's going to want to fight all these things. But he that is slow to anger is going to appease that strife. So we're seeing almost almost like in action this happening, this discernment, that a wrathful man has stirred up this strife, but a wise man says, you know what, we're going to have to stop this here. We're going to have to make right and, and, and forget this foolishness, forget this strife, forget these fightings, and move on. 
We're, we're grown men. We're mature men. We don't need to be doing this. So that, that's, that's just one interesting thought here about discernment. God wants us to use discernment in action every day so that we can know whether somebody is wise and whether somebody is foolish and how to get ourselves away from foolish situations and into wise situations. Verse number 19, The way of the slothful man is as in hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. This is talking about two different ways, the difficult way and the easy way. Being slothful in your life and in your work, you're going to be moving as if you're moving through a hedge of thorns. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be treacherous. It's going to be grueling, and it's going to waste a lot of time in your life. But the way of the righteous is made plain. It's simple. It's, it's straight to the point, A to B, point A to B. However, the slothful are trying to find point F, Q, R, S, all the way through A to B, and they just don't even know how to get there because they're walking through this hedge of thorns. Everything is difficult for them because they're lazy. Verse number 20. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. You are known by how you treat your parents. This is just a realistic fact here. Honor thy father and thy mother, because they created you. They created you. By the grace of God, they formed you. Your father begat you, and your mother bared you. They created you, and they feed you. They give you life. They gave you clothing, shelter, warmth, food, everything you need. And if you do not honor your parents... You are known by that dishonor. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. You can see that simply. You can see it very simply. And it's really such a shame, too, because a lot of folks today will look at it as if a father or mother who does not like their abominable children, as if they're abusive or no good, when the reality is that's what the Bible tells us is going to happen. Regardless, a man doesn't even have to be righteous or of God whatsoever to have that same feeling. If a man has a wicked child, he is going to sigh and groan in his spirit because that child is doing him nothing but harm and wrong. You do not even have to be of God or righteous or know the word of God at all to have this experience, and I've seen it firsthand from folks all over who have the same situation. Fathers who cannot stand their children because their children are nothing but wicked, regardless of how they raise them. Verse number 21. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. This is another verse of discernment. So folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. So let's define a few things here. Folly means, again, as we saw last chapter, the consequence of foolishness. So folly, this consequence of foolishness, let's, let's say I do a foolish thing. I, I, I put up a, a cord across a way and just so I can see people trip over and fall. Well, the folly would be folks tripping over that cord and falling. These people aren't fools who are tripping over this cord. They didn't see it. They didn't know. I'm putting a stumbling block before folks just so I can laugh. So that's folly. Them stumbling over this cord that I've created, them tripping over this, that's folly. It's the consequence of my foolishness. So folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. To be destitute of wisdom means that you have none of it. You're void of it. You have absolutely no wisdom about you whatsoever, regardless of whatever you may think, believe, or feel. But a man of understanding walketh uprightly. A man of understanding doesn't look around to say, well, you know, I could make that guy trip and fall, and it would be pretty funny. No, a man just continues to walk about his way and go about his business and do righteousness. Verse number 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. Now, this counsel is the counsel of the Lord, and it is oftentimes many the case as to why 
countries and nations, kingdoms, kings and rulers and leaders have had many different counselors and advisors, spiritual advisors and righteous men who would be able to tell them exactly what God would say in that situation. You know, what would Jesus do? And the reason why is because right counsels are necessary for our life. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. If you do not have the counsel of God at your side, many times what you purpose to do will be disappointed. It will be let down. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Now, this is also an interesting thought here because some people will say, well, doesn't that mean that if you have more people siding with you, then you have more you know, establishment of your own ideals or your own purposes? No. This is specifically, again, just like how when God talks about the knowledge in the Bible, he's talking about his knowledge, the word of God. This is actual knowledge, not just learning, you know, simple arithmetic or simple this or simple that. You know, those things are necessary, but those things are also biblical. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it is right counsel that establishes those purposes. Take counsel with God to be blessed in your life. Verse number 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? Now this verse here is talking about that we need to discern what needs to be said and when. Now, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, Cast not your pearls before swine, and give not that which is holy unto the dogs, lest they turn and rend you. The reason why Jesus tells us this is because not everybody you come across needs to be witnessed to with the word of God. You need to follow the Spirit's call and moving, because the fact of the matter is, is that there's just some folks out there who are no good regardless, and there's nothing you can do to change that. You're not the witness they need. Uh, uh, I learned this the hard way, cast not your pearls before swine. When I went out with street preachers and preached in a sodomite parade, those folk are swine. There is nothing better to say than just calling them swine. That's that's what they are. That's what they do. That's how they are. They live in filth. They live in uh, disgusting abomination. They are swine. Sodomites are swine. And the Bible tells us to cast not your pearls before swine. And the reason why is because when I was there, I saw a definite understanding of this. Folks all around me were just nothing but mocking the word of God in any way, shape, or form. They weren't listening. They did not care. Many times they tried to assault us, uh, but that wasn't going to go very far due to us men of God being more than capable of defending ourselves. And the fact of the matter is, is that they received nothing from it. However, there have been many times where I have witnessed to sodomites one-on-one, -on -one, and they have listened to the word of God. And the reason why is because they weren't with a crowd of people that they could harass me with. Many times, crowd mentality controls people more than they would like to believe. And sometimes the crowd creates the swine. And that's the reality here, is that a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? We have to. We have to understand that when we speak right things, we're going to have joy by that. And if we speak in the right season, it's going to be good. We have to make sure that we are speaking and, and really witnessing correctly the word of God and in the correct season. Now, does that mean only in fall? No. Due season just means correct timing. That's all that means here. Verse number 24, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Wisdom leads to God, in turn leading to heaven, salvation. God's wisdom is Genesis to Revelation. It is not just Proverbs. It is not just the Gospels. It is not just Revelation. It is not just the prophets. It's not just the law, so on and so forth. It is the entirety of the Bible. Genesis to Revelation, it needs to be read. Therefore, God's wisdom 
always leads to salvation. Why? Because the entire Old Testament leads to the coming of Christ. The entire New Testament tells us who Jesus is and what will it be at the end of the age and how we can be saved. The gospel is important in every aspect of our lives. Wisdom is important in every aspect of our lives. God requires saved Christian folk to walk in wisdom. You do not get right with God and you do not stay right with God to walk in wickedness. Verse number 25. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Pride cometh before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Your house will be destroyed if you are proud. That's, that's the reality of things. This pride movement today, it will be destroyed. Eventually. Even if it takes a little bit of time. Why is it taking so long? Well, because God is long-suffering towards us. He does not want anyone to go to hell. He wants every last human being that he has created to get right with him, to understand who Christ is, to yield to Jesus as, their, as he is their Savior and Lord, to yield to that and to repent of their wickedness. God's giving us all that opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Verse number 26. The thoughts of the wicked are abomination to the Lord, but the words of the peer are pleasant words. Really take a look at this. This again is telling us that the wicked are abomination more so than just one way. We saw how they were abomination in their religion. We also saw how they were abomination in their way. This is saying that even their thoughts are abomination. This is the reason why I said earlier that God's not just telling us that the sin of wickedness is abomination, but that the wicked folk who commit that sin are abomination, because it goes deeper than that. And again, it's going to go even deeper than this. But the reality is, even their thoughts are abomination to God. doesn't matter if they're thinking good thoughts. The unsaved are abomination to God. Verse number 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. Now this verse is talking about a gift for bribery or to overlook evil. So, for instance, like let's say I had some family members who were liars or thieves or whatever, and they knew that I, I knew they stole from me or they lied to me. So what they would do is, you know, give me a gift and say, hey, you know, I love you. How about we just overlook this? How about you just stop doing that sin, that wickedness, that vile hatred of me? Because when you commit those sins against other folk, you are showing forth your hatred to them. That's what sin is. It is a form of hatred. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. So if you're greedy of gain, you're going to trouble your house. You're going to make it hard for your house to do anything right. But he that hateth gifts shall live. He that hate these, these gifts of bribery shall live. Verse number 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Righteous folk get into the Bible. Look at this. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. Studieth what? The Bible. How can you answer the words of truth to them around you, to those you need to witness to, if you have not studied them? Study the Bible. But the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. This could very well be just another verse of discernment telling us about who is a righteous witness and who is not. Who is a righteous Christian and who is not. Verse number 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. This is the consummation in this chapter of these, these four verses that we saw. Verse 8, verse 9, verse 26, and now verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. Wicked prayers are not heard. The only prayer that a wicked man can pray that is heard by God is the prayer 
of requesting Christ to come into your heart and to be your Lord and Savior. That is the one and only prayer that can be heard by God from the wicked. One and only. That's the reality here. The wicked are abominable to God. Everything abominable to him, he does not hear, he does not take part in. So therefore, even their prayer is abomination. Verses number 30 through 31. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The ear that heareth the proof of life abideth among the wise. All life is affected by wisdom, and that's what this is talking about here. And it's talking about this in a metaphorical way, uh, using different body parts of, of our own, uh, because these body parts are how we observe things. So the light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart. The light or the singleness, or the goodness of the eyes, when you do right and good, and you see good and right, that's going to rejoice your heart. And a good report maketh the bones fat. When folks tell you the good that has happened because of their witnessing and because of their ministry, that makes the bones fat. When people tell you the good of their job and how it's really helped them, the good of their home and the good of their children, and how it's really been a blessing unto them, that makes the bones fat. It makes, makes us joyous. and it, it doesn't make us feel withered. It makes us quite well. In verse 31, the ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. Uh, this is just, you know, again, God is telling us that through our ears we hear. If we hear the reproof of life, we abide among the wise. God tells us to do just that, to keep company with wisdom. For whom you keep company with, that is who you will be. Verse 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. This is, again, a verse of discernment. Discernment is very important for wisdom, because without discernment, you can't really tell the difference between wisdom and foolishness, and that's the reason why God is so very apt to show us the, these things. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. You despise your own living soul. Now, that's your eternal being. Your spirit is not your eternal being. Your spirit is the life of your flesh. The soul is your eternal being. Your soul is what gets saved immediately upon accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And he that refuseth instruction, the instruction of the Lord, despiseth his own soul. But he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. That's just obvious. If you hear reproof and you want to hear that reproof, you're going to get understanding from that reproof. Even if that reproof was not necessary, you can still get understanding from it. Even if you've already heard it before, you can still get understanding from it. How? Well, let's say you didn't know that that man was wise or not, but you're already wise, and he tries to give you a reproof of wisdom. You've already heard it before. You don't need to hear it. You believe in it. But now you understand that man is wise. And finally, verse number 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. Fear God and be humble. That's what we're completing this chapter in. Fear God and, uh, and be humble. God says the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. If you do not fear God, you will not have wisdom, regardless of how many times you read the Bible, and it's why many people do not get the book of Proverbs. Fear God, and you will get it. Be humble, and you will be honored by God. He will be the one who honors you. He will honor your life. He will lift you up, but you have to be humble. You have to abase yourself. Proverbs chapter 15 alerts us to the hidden fact that everything the wicked are and all that they do is abomination to the Lord. God hears not the prayer of the wicked. Ye must be born again to become a child of God and to be heard by him. Discernment seems to become increasingly more important as well as we move forward. Because God does not want us fooled by wolves in sheep's clothing. Very important. And it is the reason why we need discernment. 
so that we are not fooled by folks who claim the name of Jesus and have nothing to do with him. I want to thank you for joining me today as we looked further into God's wisdom at Proverbs chapter 15. And I do pray that you'll join me next time for Proverbs chapter 16. I'll see you then.